AP Physics 2, Unit 3, Lesson B, uh, Multiple Choice Explained. This is the second part of the, those. This is number 26, 27, 28, 31, 34, 35, 36, 37, and 53. Let's get started. figure above on the left represents the horizontal electric field near the center of two large vertical parallel plates near the Earth's surface. The plates have a height of H and a length of L, okay, and are separated by a distance W as shown on the right. The field has a magnitude of E, a small object with mass M, and we know since they're two parallel plates, as long as you're reasonably close to the center of them, the electric field will be uniform. That's why the electric field is a constant magnitude. It's the same anywhere between them. A small object with mass m and charge positive q, where m is equal to q e over g. That's, that's probably the fact that m is equal to q times the electric field divided by g is probably something they've created. Don't think too much into that. Now, we'll see as we go along, but I just had the feeling that's something that they created to make this problem work out. It is released from rest at a, at a point midway between the plates. Okay. Whew. Point R, S, T, and U are located between the plates as shown in the figure above, with points R and T equidistant from point S. That V, R, S, V, S, T, V, T, TU and VRU be the magnitudes of the electrical potential differences between the pairs of points. Okay, how do the magnitudes of these potential differences compare? So, since the field points, I believe, this way, the farther apart they are in the direct direction of the field, the bigger the, the potential difference. So for example, R and S have are not far apart at all. In fact, in terms of the, the going left or right, they're at the same left and right position. So it all will boil down to the left and right position. So the ones that are farthest apart left and left to right, first one would be SU. That would have the biggest. Now the smallest would be RS. So we'll have to look at this, but, um, All right, SU is not an option. So the next <laughs> next ones, because that's not one of the things that they give here, ST would be the next two farthest apart. Um, RT will be the same distance apart as ST, because all that matters is the is the horizontal displacement here. So I'm looking for RT and ST to be the same. So right away I'm leaning towards this one. RU is the largest distance. So that's kind of like S. In fact, it's exactly like SU, like I was talking about a moment ago. So that would have the biggest. TU would definitely be the smallest distance horizontally. So that would be the smallest. So I'm going to go with B. Which is verifying this is number 26. And the answer that they give is not B which is interesting because I'm pretty confident on my answers, but that's okay. 26, they give an answer of A. So let's take a look. I'm feeling pretty confident about these, but let's see. They're saying that RU is greater than ST. I'll buy that. That ST and TU. Oh, my apologies. All right, so I misread. I misread a set of letters, so I'm not right because I misread RS. I took RS to be RT. So I, when I read it, I took in my head this was this was RT, not F, not RS. RS should definitely be the least, so it's at the end, because right, there is no difference between them. So this one is the correct answer. Yeah, that's why it's good they had the answers next to me. 
27. After the object is released from rest, which of the following paths shown in the figure above is a possible trajectory for the object? Hmm, interesting. All right. So the object is going to accelerate both downward and it's going to accelerate horizontally. If the object was only was moving at constant velocity horizontally and accelerating downward, then this would be the path. But I see it as it's accelerating both, so I would lean towards C, and I'm betting that this is that it's a straight line, particularly considering this value that they gave us right here. So, for example, the horizontal acceleration due to the electric field is going to be the force produced by the electric field divided by the mass of the object. The vertical acceleration by gravity is going to be the weight of the object, the force of gravity, mg, divided by the mass of the object. Well, that's just going to work out to be g, isn't it? Yeah, we make, we make sense. So what about this force here? So the acceleration due to gravity is obviously going to be g. Here, they're telling us that the electrical acceleration, the acceleration that is in the horizontal dimension, that force should be the electric field times the charge on the object. So that's going to be electric field times Q. Notice they rewrite, they want us to rewrite the mass as QE over G. Hmm. So QE over G. Q. This is a Q. There we go. Aha. The acceleration for the electrical, for the horizontal, turns out to also be G. See, I told you they made that up to make everything work. Since they're the same, I would expect it to follow a straight line path. It's going to accelerate downward at the same rate that it accelerates horizontally, so it should follow a straight line path. I would go with C, and that is the correct answer. Twenty-eight. Speed of a proton moving in an electric field changes from VI to VF over a certain time interval. Let the mass and charge of the proton be denoted as MP and E. Through what potential difference did the proton move during this interval? So change in kinetic energy is going to equal delta V times the charge on the proton. And they want to know delta V. So the change in kinetic energy is kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. So equals delta V E. I'll get rid of this. I already have the E there. All right. So right away, if you look at this, change in kinetic energy all is due to the change in velocity. That's why you see these here. All right. Let's go. Before we go too far into the algebra here, do you notice that if I'm going to solve for delta V, I have to divide by E. So I can rule out this answer and this answer because there's no E in the bottom here. There should be an E there. Now what else do I know about kinetic energy? See, this way you don't have to go through all this algebra because what else do I know about kinetic energy? It's, it's one half, kinetic energy is one half m v squared. Take a look at your answers. Yeah, that's right. And only one of them has got v being squared. This has to be the right answer. So this is an example of some, one person's going to try to do all the algebra to make this right here, when you divide by the e, look like that. And they're probably going to make a mistake and have to go and get the wrong answer. Truth be told, they're likely to. But if you use a little bit of, of reasoning here, someone that understands, you know, sets this up, for example, you're like, oh, wait a second, that, there's an E in the bottom. And boom, you got it down to a 50-50. And even if you're in a hurry, you're like, well, I know it's one half mv squared, so let's just go with the v squared. Boom, done.
I never actually confirmed it, but those two things would lead me to believe that there's my answer. 31. Statements that are true for a stationary charged point particle include which of the following? Stationary, okay. The electric field is field created by the charge at any single point is a vector. Well, yes, electric fields are vectors, okay. The inverse square law, law applies to the force, the field, and the electric potential. Oh, no. They were on the roll, but electric potential is not an inverse square. Electric potential for a point charge is KQ over R. Notice the distance is not squared. So, no, so 2 is definitely not an option. The electric field is directed away from the particle if the charge is positive, and that is true. The electric field will point in the direction that a little positive test charge would go and if this is positive that would be a way so I'll go with one and three as my two answers here this is 31 and it is D so I am correct they were good on this one until they got to here electric potential is, is not an inverse square neither is, ele neither is electrical potential energy 's very hot gas composed of equal numbers of positive and negative ions is in a closed thermally insulated container and is in thermal equilibrium at a temperature T something TO I assume figure above represents the initial distribution of the ions which would be random a strong uniform electric field is directed toward the bottom of the page it's now created in the container, and the gas is allowed to reach new thermal equilibrium at temperature T1. How does the, ele not, the electric field is, okay, number 34. The electric field is then turned off, and the gas is allowed to reach a final temperature, e equilibrium temperature. How does T2 compare to T1, and why? I think I would take this from an energy standpoint. In in both turning on by turning on the field and then turning it off you've put energy into the system something has forced them to the charges to separate because that's what's going to happen right we're going to separate when we put them in an electric field uh, the negatives are going to let's say the field was directed downward i believe so the positives will end up down here and the negatives will end up more up here well, it took work to do that. It certainly took work to move them apart. When you turn it off, that work is still present in there. You can't undo that. It's still, they're, they're, you're still going to have a, it's going to be a higher temperature when they start moving around. Um, now, when is it? So the, so I would go with T2. The, the electric potential energy of the separated ions, so there's potential energy here, is converted into kinetic energy as they mix and collide. So these are going to shoot towards each other. So when it, that increased kinetic energy is going to be show up as a change in temperature. So this says D. I would say D, and I would be correct. It's got to be greater. Work done... Um, turning off the field doesn't necessarily involve work flipping the switch might but you know what I mean um, I like D as, as an explanation much better alright same scenario now number 35 which of the following best represents a possible distribution of the gas ions at temperature T1 well we already kind of talked about this the fields directed downward that means the positives will be pushed downward and the negatives upward. So I would expect this to be my best possible answer. Most of the positives are down po and negatives are up. And that is correct. Funny, I would, I would consider 35 to be the question that should be before 34, but that's, all right. that's just nitpicking. Two large flat parallel conducting plates are 0 0.04 meters apart, as shown above. The lower plate is at a potential of 2 volts with respect to the ground, and the upper plate is a potential of 8 volts with respect to ground. Point P is located 
0.01 meters above the lower plate. Okay. All right, the electric potential, so it is a uniform field. So if you're a fourth of the way up, which it is, then you will have a, your potential will go up a fourth of whatever that difference is. The difference is eight. So it has jumped up a fourth of eight is two. So it's jumped up two volts here and is now at a position of four volts with respect to the ground. So I would go with four volts for that one, 36. So they want to know the volt with respect to ground, but the difference is what matters when we go to figure out how many volts it would have jumped. So it's jumped two, it started at two, which means it's at four. And we can do that ratio thing because the uniform, the field is uniform between these. The magnitude, magnitude of the electric field, ooh, Ooh, speaking of that idea, the magnitude of the electric field at point P is the same as it is anywhere else between those plates because it is a uniform field. So um, we have to, I guess we have to find that. Yes. All right. So the there's an equation that says, let's see if I can remember it correctly. Delta V is equal to, hold on. Hold on, I don't want to mess this one up. So let's go here and we'll cheat our way through this. This isn't cheating because you have this sheet too. There it is. E is equal to delta V over R. That's the one I'm looking for. So electric field is the voltage difference delta V over R. Well, in this case, delta V is eight volts. Right, that's eight volt difference between them. And R is 0 0.04. So 4 goes into 800 twice, but it's going to be 200. I would say 200. And it's the same everywhere. So it doesn't really matter where you are. But this is the difference between the two plates. All right, 53. Two charged metal spheres are connected by a conducting wire. Sphere A is larger than sphere B. We don't want to cross these very often. Um, which of the following is true about the magnitude of electric potential at surface A due to that at surface B? So if they're connected, they're not going to have the same charge on them because the larger sphere, A, can hold more charge and keep it all spread apart at the same distance that it does on B. So the amount of charge held by the two of them is not the same. But what is the same between them is the V, the electric potential. Because if it wasn't, just like if you had two shelves that weren't at the same height and you put a board between them, that's like the wire, then balls would roll from the higher shelf to the lower. Unless those two shelves are right at the same height, and then you put a ball on that wire, and it's going to stay there. Or you put a ball on one shelf, it'll stay on that shelf. So the potential has to be the same. So the big idea is two spheres connected, two different sizes. If you let charge even out, there will be more Q here than there is here. But the voltage, the potential on both of them, on the two of them will be the same.